Hello, Northern Lands 2. I'm Matt Clancy, an economist at Iowa State University. And in April 2020, I wrote this report called The Case for Remote Work, which argued that remote work is going to be a lot more common, and that's a good thing going forward. That report was based on all the academic literature that I surveyed that was published before April of last year. And in the 11 months since then, there's been this explosion of new academic research related to remote work. This figure you're looking at charts the number of economics papers uh, in the REPEC depository mentioning the phrase remote work in the title or abstract. That nearly vertical line that you see at the end is the explosion of new work that's come out during COVID-19 about remote work. So after diving into this literature, I wanna to talk to you about three lessons I'm taking away. First, before COVID-19, remote work was rare because of misperceptions about its productivity that were hard to fix. So new work from 2020 confirms earlier findings from before COVID that remote work really does actually work for lots of kinds of jobs. Barrero, Bloom, and Davis have a study from the end of last year that reports on the results of a big survey of more than 10,000 US adults uh, between August and November. Fully 41% of respondents think they're more efficient working from home than they were in the office. 44% think there wasn't really any difference, they're the same. These kind of results are broadly consistent with lots of other surveys about perceptions of remote work during COVID-19 and this emerging evidence that's based not on worker perceptions, but actually on measures of their output. So if remote work is so productive, why did it take COVID-19? Why wasn't it more common before? And research from this year has also helped us answer that question. Most importantly, we now know perceptions about the efficacy of remote work were just way off. A survey by Adam Ozemek last year reports on uh, survey results from April of hiring managers that found many more were underestimating the potential of remote work than were overestimating it. Uh, Barrero, Bloom, and Davis have a survey of workers later in the pandemic, August through November, that also finds consistent misperceptions about how well remote work works. 19% of their respondents said working from home was hugely better than expected and 61%, well over half, said it was better than they expected. Only 13% thought working from home was worse than they had anticipated. So one reason remote work was more common before COVID was simply that views on it were off. But why did those views persist? Again, recent work provides some answers. First, correcting those beliefs was expensive. One survey found that adapting to remote work during the pandemic took about 14 hours of training per person and about $660 in new equipment, again, per person. Moreover, a consistent theme of lots of studies from Microsoft was that experienced remote workers tended to fare better and have less disruption during the pandemic than those who were new to working remotely. Taken together, that means it's both expensive for a company to try out remote work and also that the full benefits of doing it take a while to become clear. Now, a second really interesting study by Emmanuel and Harrington shows prior to COVID-19, less productive workers gravitated to remote work, at least in the context they study of an American call center. Now, this created a perception that remote work itself was inherently unproductive when it was the reverse that was actually true. In their paper, they show that when COVID-19 forced everyone in the call centers to switch to working remotely, productivity measured in calls per hour went up, they also show that prior to COVID-19, when they started offering on-site workers the option to switch to being remote workers, the ones who made the switch saw their productivity go up measured the same way with no decline in quality. But here's the key. Because it was the least productive call center workers, the ones who answered the fewest calls per hour, who seized on the opportunity to work remotely, on average, remote workers were less productive prior to COVID-19 than the ones who stayed working in the office. Now, if that finding generalizes beyond call centers, it can help us understand another reason why remote work was so rare before COVID-19. If everybody believes remote work isn't productive, then workers who don't care about seeming less productive, they don't care about climbing the career ladder maybe, and so on, they're gonna be the ones who gravitate towards working remotely. And that's gonna ensure that remote workers are on average, perhaps less productive. And that's going to reinforce the belief that remote work isn't productive. Fortunately, it now seems that COVID-19 has broken that belief. Surveys indicate most realize that remote work is quite productive. 
So the second thing I want to talk about is that it looks like remote work is going to continue to get better. While remote work seems to function pretty well on average, it does have drawbacks that people have long kind of worried about. There's some evidence that it's harder for new employees who are fully remote to form social networks with their coworkers and that certain kinds of tasks are harder to replicate online, such as big picture, creative kind of planning work. But we've got these indications that as good as it might be on average, it's gonna actually continue to get better. The fact that remote work appears to be likely to persist for a long time has created this really large market opportunity for firms that want to innovate and improve remote work because they know there'll be a market for the R&D effort they put into it. One study looks at the share of U.S. patent applications that mention words related to remote work, and they show that since it became clear that COVID-19 was going to become really serious, that share has risen really dramatically, indicating lots of new effort to develop remote work technologies. Moreover, internal studies at Microsoft consistently find that problems associated with remote work are less common among experienced remote workers. And those same studies also identify policies and processes that Microsoft developed that mitigated various remote work challenges. One example they gave was a more formal uh, check-in process for new hires with one-on-ones and you know, explicit programs to virtually help people socialize and meet each other. As technology gets better, as people get more experience, and as these new processes are discovered and diffused, the experience of remote work is going to get better. But on top of that, many of the challenges associated with remote work are likely to be reduced once the pandemic ends. Social isolation due to social distancing means that we're not offsetting uh, the decline in work interactions with an increase in out-of-work interactions with people. Moreover, if it really is hard to collaborate with some kinds of people on some kinds of tasks, then a hybrid environment where you can go into the office and meet these people a few days a week could largely solve those problems. The third thing I want to talk about is that remote work looks like it's certainly going to be a lot more common after COVID-19 subsides. So in a large survey of U.S. workers, Barrero, Bloom, and Davis ask if you've talked to your employer about what the post-COVID-19 plan is for remote work. And they use those responses to estimate that 22% of all U.S. workdays will be done remotely after COVID-19 ends, compared to just 5% of days before that. And that estimate is actually conservative because if uh, an employee says they haven't spoken to their employer about the post-COVID remote policy, these guys assume that that means it will be fully on site. Now, for comparison, workers would actually prefer to work almost twice as much remotely, 44%. We've also got evidence that's not just cheap talk from surveys. Changes in property prices are also consistent with an increased perception that we'll be working remotely in the future. A paper by Gupta and co-authors documents that the price of residential properties far from the city center has been rising more quickly than the prices of downtown city center things. In San Francisco, New York, as you see here in red, there's actually been price declines for residential properties in the city center. This reflects an increased demand to live far away from the city center. This data is adjusted for the quality of housing. So it's not just that people want bigger houses while they're social distancing. Moreover, this paper finds the effect of rising suburban prices relative to city center prices is stronger when there's a greater share of jobs that could be formed remotely in the city. So if you think of prices of houses as a forecast about the desirability of living in that house for many years to come, it indicates it's become more attractive to live far away from the city center than it has in the past. So to sum up, incorrect incorrect beliefs about remote work before COVID-19, they got stuck because it was expensive to test them in terms of time and money, and possibly because prior to COVID, this belief was self-fulfilling because it attracted workers who are actually less productive than their peers. COVID-19 seems to have broken this belief. Second, remote work looks like it's going to get better through better technology, practices, and just more experience. And third, it's probably going to become a lot more common. Now, this is a huge literature and I've only scratched the surface. Uh, If you want to read some more, you can check out my newsletter where I talk about some other things I learned from this uh, literature. But anyway, thanks everyone for listening uh, and have a good day. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, that was a fantastic talk. And, and you joined us last time. Um, and who'd have thought that 
Um, we'd be here a year later. Um, mm -hmm. You were definitely on the money, weren't you? But um, I've got some, uh, we've got some questions for you and we'll have a, have a, have a little chat. But um, I'm going to, um, I've got a couple of questions here that we, we, we'd like to ask you as ODI leads. And, and one of them is, over the last year or so, in, in terms of the, the pandemic, what have you changed your mind on? So, um, you know, going into this, for example, when I first started studying remote work, I thought, uh, uh, you know, we could do pretty much everything online. And I quickly learned that's not necessarily the case. You know, there's there's things that, that really do work better in person. And I think, for example, meeting new people is still harder to do online. And then it's easier to collaborate once you know somebody and have an established relationship. So things to help meet people uh, is something that I learned quickly that you know is not easy to necessarily do online. And then in the last year, I think one specific thing is starting this. I thought, well, every you know, one thing we're going to have to get used to is co get comfortable chatting over video chat, and everybody's going to have to learn to keep their video things on because that gives you this high fidelity feedback. Multiple, you know, I can read your subtle facial expressions and and adjust what I'm saying. And there's an extent to which that is true, but also, uh, you know, people talk about Zoom fatigue, and this is not. This is not just pandemic fatigue. Like I think there's something really uh, real about uh, chatting online and with video because it's not like if you're in a big meeting, uh, this thing is pointed straight at your face. So it's kind of like you're sitting right across a few feet away, looking at somebody right in the face, and you kind of have to perform that you're paying attention uh, uh, in a way that is tiring. And so I teach, for example, a class uh, on economics, and we all meet online like everybody else these days, and. Uh, originally, I sort of tried to get everyone to turn their cameras on, and and now I don't because I think that uh, it's just easier for everyone, uh, and and you don't actually need to perform that like when you're hearing a lecture or talking to a professor that you need to be, you know, the same way that if I'm having a very intense conversation one on one like with you here. Yeah. So that's 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 two examples. Yeah, fantastic. And and so you're an economist, right? Um, mm -hmm. and economists love agglomeration benefits. That's right. And we, we all get together in cities and innovation goes through the roof and we get exponential growth in ideas. Mm -hmm. So what, what's going to happen? Yeah, so this is the big, I mean, this is, I think, the really big question for long run impact of, uh, of remote work. And so when I first, one reason I first became an advocate for remote work, I'm actually an economist who studies innovation. And uh, well before COVID-19, I had noticed that all of these lots of studies about these agglomeration benefits and how they relate to innovation had been weakening over time. And so you see really big effects in the 70s and then they get weaker and weaker. And depending on how you measure it, some sometimes it's not even there in like the 2000s. And uh, but it depends on how you measure it and lots of other ways you measure it. It's it's still there. It's still real. It's not in your imagination that being physically close uh, makes uh, things more productive. So one thing that's been really interesting this year is economists have started looking at What's, trying to think about what's going to be the impact. We can't really look at the data yet because it's still too early and we've got lots of other things happening. It's not like remote work is the only thing that's changed in the last year. But um, uh, so they've got models of the spatial economy that incorporate agglomeration benefits. And so economists have begun tweaking these and sort of think what happens if a third of the workforce isn't physically there? And um, you get some subtle effects. Like there's one paper that looks at LA, Los Angeles, and it uses real data to try to model how people make decisions about where to live. And then they allow a third of them to work remotely instead. And in that mod study, uh, productivity goes up. It goes down when these people leave, they take their agglomeration benefits with them. But then that lowers the price of real estate in the center of town and all these places that were out in the suburbs that can't do their jobs remotely, they come into the center of town. And at the same time, you have sort of better matching between workers and uh, and the jobs they work at because remote workers can work for a job from a distance, but also even commuters, there's less people on the road. And so they can commute more farther away to a job that is a better fit for them. So in that paper, they find a small increase. There's other papers though that say, no, like if you model the whole United States, for example, people leave the big cities, they take their agglomeration benefits with them. And then that that would be bad. But what's interesting about that paper, and you can sort of see references to which papers I'm talking about. I, I have a little link to my website. Um, they look at, well, what if a, a remote worker is some proportion as good as, you know, what if they generate half the agglomeration spillovers as somebody who's really there? And they sort of how good they would 
need to be to sort of not lose out. And they find that if a, a remote worker is about generate 60% of the agglomeration benefits of somebody who's physically in the room, uh, then things work out great for everybody. Uh, but like I said, this is all still really early. This is sort of theoretical models and, and it's not based on, on data yet because it's just too early to say. But I still think it's really interesting to sort of start speculating about. Yeah, cool. Um, um, I, well, um, you know, maybe there's going to be cheap areas to live like Berlin in the 80s and 90s, man. You know, is that the yeah. problem of those would be um, fantastic. Um, so who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, and I mean, I think that's always been an argument too, is that maybe remote work works well for some industries that are more mature, and then they clear out the city and sort of keep uh, real estate prices low enough for the new guys who uh, need to start up in garages or, you know, create studios and cheap real estate. Uh, they can come in and sort of, they can't do their jobs remotely, but they're able to sort of uh, create something new that wouldn't be, happen without remote work. Fantastic. So Matt, it's been it's been a real pleasure to have you on. Um, this is one of my favourite talks of the uh, uh, of Northern Lands Three, and um, we're obviously um, really important um, work for everybody about how we're doing it. So it's been fantastic to to have you on um, on board. You just published something on Medium, is that right? Yeah. So uh, you know, there's a big literature, more than I could cover in my 10 minute talk. And so in the talk, I focused on three lessons, but I actually came up with six. And so I wrote a longer piece about them in. Uh, and I posted it on Medium, and there's a link to that from, from my website, too. And also, Fantastic. that gives all the links to the articles that I talked about in the talk. Fantastic. So thanks again. Um